We have to start on time because we have a live stream arranged through Facebook. We're going to be live streaming, so we're going to start precisely on time for people who are watching from home or work. Uh, thank you all for being here. My name is Sarojini Lal. I'm the district director for Assembly Member Laura Friedman. Um, and I'm going to let her open the event. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarojini. And thanks to all of you for being here. And if you're watching at home, thank you for watching from home. And I want to also take a moment just to thank the City of Los Angeles' Rec and Parks Department for helping us host this event at the Friendship Auditorium today here in Los Feliz in the 43rd District. And of course, for all the panelists for joining us, taking the time uh, to be here. And I'll be introducing them in just a moment. So the most important thing that I can do as your representative is to make sure that I bring you the information that, that I know what your immediate needs are and that I make sure to bring you information that's crucial to you. And what we know right now, and I'm sure we'll hear more about this from Cal Fire, is that the wildfires that the state experience, has been experiencing are gonna, are, have been dramatically increasing in um, frequency, in severity, and we don't expect that to stop anytime soon. That's going to continue into the future. And something that a lot of people aren't aware, and I hope that all of you are aware or become aware, is that a lot of Los Angeles is considered to be in the highest fire severity zone that we have in the state. Now, the, some of the recent fires that we've had in the last couple of years, fires like the Woolsey Fire in Los Angeles and Ventura County, and a year ago right here in Burbank, show us that if you're in Los Angeles, if you live anywhere near the, wild the wildlife interface zones, if you live in the hills here in Los Feliz or Glendale or Burbank, you are vulnerable to wildfire. The other thing that the more recent fires have taught us is that there are ways that we can protect our property, our homes, our neighbors, and we're going to be hearing about those tonight. Um, and one thing I want to stress is that it's important that we think of this as not just an individual exercise, but as a community exercise. Because one or two out of compliance properties can put an entire neighborhood at risk. So we need to not just look at our own property, but look at what's around us and work with our neighbors and with our elected officials at every level to make sure that we work on building a more resilient community and a more resilient neighborhood. Uh, I chair the Natural Resources Committee in the Assembly, and my committee also has jurisdiction over forestry, wildfire, CAL FIRE, and a lot of the issue areas that um, impact wildfire. So I've become um, extremely engaged in the wildfire discussions in the last couple of years. Last year, I uh, authored a bill, AB 2911, that updates previous fire safety legislation to respond to our current wildfire threat, including strengthening building standards for fire resistance and making changes like requiring more two access roads for new subdivisions and high fire areas and making sure that before subdevelopments are entitled in high fire severity standards, CAL FIRE doesn't just get to weigh in, but has a lot more authority about whether or not these projects are able to move forward. Uh, this year I'm working with a on AB 1516, which we've worked on in conjunction with CAL FIRE and um, a lot of our safety experts to create a new non-combustible zone from zero to five feet from structures in high fire severity zones because a lot of the fires, and I think you're going to see some slides that show fires that don't just move like a wall of fire, but embers float around in the air, and an ember can move a great distance. And if it hits something combustible that's right against your house, you have a good chance of that fire getting into your house. And fires and, and structures oftentimes happen from the inside out because embers manage to get into a structure. Uh, AB 1034, which I authored, strengthens emergency preparedness and training standards for community care facilities like senior centers. And we've been working on legislation in the past year to make sure that all of our residential care facilities have updated emergency plans so that people don't get stranded behind or left behind vulnerable populations in a fire. And lastly, I was able to secure $9 million this year um, from Governor Newsom in the budget to help with defensible space requirements with setting up programs with our fire safety councils to help low-income residents and seniors be able to comply. 
So with that, I think that we should probably go to our panel and what we'll do is we'll hear from each of them and we're going to turn the lights down in a minute so that you can see the PowerPoints and then we'll go to questions from, from the audience. Uh, so our panelists include David Haas, who's CAL FIRE's Regional Urban Forester, Sally Westlake from the California Department of Insurance, Associate Insurance Compliance Officer, Deputy Chief Armando Hogan from LA Fire Department, he's the Commander of Operations, West Bureau, Jim Acosta from the California Office of Emergency Services, he's our Senior Emergency Services Coordinator, and David Barrett from My Safe LA, he's the Executive Officer. So we have a really incredible panel of experts, and I'm, again, very grateful to all of you for taking the time to be here. Um, I think David Haas is going first. Thank you. Thank you all for having me tonight. My name is David Haas. Uh, I had been Cal Fire's Regional Urban Forester for LA and Ventura counties for almost four years. Uh, a couple months ago I switched. I'm now the unit forester for our San Bernardino unit, which includes San Bernardino, Inyo, and Mono counties. Uh, in addition to that, Cal Fire has six contract counties where we essentially pay the county to do wildland fire protection services within state responsibi responsibility area within those counties. Uh, one of those is LA County, so San Bernardino unit is the administrative unit for uh, LA's contract county. So today I'm going to be talking about Ready, Set, Go, which is CAL FIRE's uh, citizen wildfire preparedness slogan, let's say. So, uh, can I go to the next slide? <laughs> Thank you. So, being prepared for wildfire is the ready portion of the ready, set, go. So it's, you hear a lot about defensible space, but preparing your home for wildfire, not if it happens, when it happens, includes doing defensible space and hardening your home. And why do you need to do these? You want to protect your family. You want to protect your home. You want to protect your community, first responders, and also it's the law. Uh, go to the next slide. So California Public Resource Code 4291 specifically states that homes will have a certain amount of defensible space. And I guess before I get too far into this, it's important to point out that wildfire was around long before humans were. California's ecosystem is, is just, it's evolved with wildfire for millennia. And so it's not going anywhere. You made a very valid point. And so it's a matter of us preparing ourselves and, and we're never gonna stop wildfire, just like you wouldn't stop a hurricane or a tornado. Uh, it's a natural disaster and we need to prepare for it as such. And so we do that through defensible space and home hardening and some of the other things we'll talk about. So next slide, please. So this is the diagram for the state standards for dispensable, defensible space, which you'll find in Public Resource Code 4291. So there's really two zones. There's zone one, we call it lean green and lean clean and green. <laughs> so that's 30 feet within the, the, the boundary of your home. And that's where you would want to remove all dead plants, grass and weeds. Uh, remove dead or dry leaves and pine needles from your yard, roof, and rain gutters. And you want to keep tree branches 10 feet away from your chimney. And also you want to break up that continuity between fuels. So you'll want to create space between individual trees or plants you may have within that 30-foot zone. And it, beyond that too, uh, you want to remove flammable materials away from your home. So wood piles, uh, you don't want to have highly flammable plants growing right up against your windows because heat not only travels through, you know, like direct flame impingement, but you have radiant heat where the, the heat from that flame travels through the air and it can start heating up and it can get so hot it breaks the glass in your windows and your homes. And uh, so we'll touch on some of that in home hardening. Uh, but within that 30 foot zone, you really want to have minimal amount of plant material. And what is there you want to have green, healthy, and as least flammable as a, a plant as possible. Uh, next slide, please. So within that second zone of defensible space is 30 to 100 feet from your home or 30 feet to your property line, because sometimes, depending on the size of your lot, uh, it may not be 100 feet from your home to the property line. So within that zone two, you need to cut or mow annual grasses to a, a maximum height of four inches. 
And here's where you'll also, whatever vegetation you have remaining in terms of trees and, trees and shrubs, you'll want to create vertical and horizontal spacing between that vegetation. And I have a, a diagram as well of what that will look like. And then you'll want to remove just, we call it duff as, as foresters, but all that dead plant material that's on the soil surface. So you, you can leave some, especially if you have a slope on your property where erosion may be an issue, but you really want to keep that to a minimum a three inch depth. And it's, again, we're never going to stop fire from coming, but if we can break up the continuity of the fuels, we can cause the rate of spread of the fire to slow significantly, if not, you know, again, uh, minimize the amount of heat and direct flame impingement that uh, goes against your home. And also when you're out there doing this, you remember that you can be a cause of fire as well when you're using uh, metallic uh, fuel, uh, you know, like lawn mowers and weed whackers and things like that, right? So if you hit a rock and you spark, you can cause a fire if you're in dry vegetation. So you wanna mow before 10 a.m. and you never wanna do that kind of work on dry, windy days. Uh, next slide. So this is, I don't know how visible that slide is for you, but this is a graphic of what creating horizontal uh, breaks in your fuel, in your horizontal fuel continuity will look like. And it's really dependent on the slope of your property. So if you're on a flat piece of ground, uh, you'll typically want to keep plants, uh, uh, you'll want a distance of two times the vegetation height between those plants. So if you have a two foot shrub, you'll want a four foot area of no vegetation around that shrub, or not even necessarily a single shrub. Sometimes you consider, consider them as like groups or islands. So maybe you've got a clump of shrubs you like, so you'll want to create a horizontal break in the continu continuity of fuels around that. And then as the slope gets steeper, you essentially double that amount of, of clearance between each individual shrub or island of shrubs. It's, as the image shows. And all this information is taken directly from CAL FIRE's Ready, Set, Go materials, which we have available back there. So I don't know how clear you can see some of this stuff, or, uh, but you can please come visit us after this and we can provide you with more information. Next slide, please. So there's horizontal continuity of fuels across the landscape, and then there's vertical continuity of fuels. So you hear a lot about ladder fuels, right? And those, those are the fuels that typically would have been consumed by low intensity fires that would have occurred in the past, but over time we've suppressed fire so much that those fuels have not been consumed by fire and now they've accumulated on the landscape. So you want to break that vertical continuity of fuels and that's a, a matter of pruning limbs on trees. So anywhere from a minimum of six to eight feet up to 15 feet high up in your tree, you would want to prune all those limbs to try to break that fuel continuity in the vertical spacing. Uh, additionally, when you have shrubs underneath trees, uh, the goal would be to minimize the amount of, of vegetation underneath the tree, but if you do want to retain shrubs under your trees, then you, you need to do three times the height of that fuel between the lowest limb on the tree. And I, again, uh, I think that's in the next slide. Yeah, so you can see that three times the shrub height uh, would be the distance you need to leave between the lowest branch on the tree to break up that vertical fuel continuity. Next slide, please. So that's defensible space in a nutshell. There's a little more to it, but uh, just kind of giving you the, the brief highlights and, and major points within uh, defensible space. And, and that's only one component of protecting your home against wildfire, the second being home hardening. So that's a basically using construction materials and practices to minimize the chance of your home catching on fire. Next slide, please. So that's, the big one is roofs. You hear a lot about wood shingle roofs, which I think as a, a state and communities, we've done a pretty good job of, of getting rid of those, but there's still some out there. So you would want your, your roof to be made of non-flammable materials like metal or tiles or composition. Uh, you want to cover vents or use very fine mesh to minimize the chance for embers to get in there. So those are the big, two big ones, roofs and, and vents where embers can blow up underneath the shingles or come in through the vents and, and all it takes is a single ember kind of smoldering in your insulation and in your attic to cause your home to catch on fire. Uh, cover, covering your eaves and non-flammable material 
using double pane windows with at least one of them being tempered glass, one of those panes to, again, because that radiant heat against your window can cause your window to break and allow embers and flames to come into your home. Uh, constructing your balconies and decks out of non-flammable material, as well as removing flammable vegetation away from and from underneath your balconies and decks, because uh, any spot where an ember can sit there and, and smolder and cause flames and uh, balcony and deck is a pretty good opportunity for fire to get started. Exterior walls, again, being made of non-flammable or less combustible materials, so no wood siding. Covering your rain gutters to minimize the amount of vegetation that can accumulate in there, and then also constructing patio covers of non-flammable materials. Uh, next slide, please. So these are just some examples of what good home defensible space and home hardening looks like, and then I'll have some examples of what bad ones look like. So you can see they, they've done a pretty good job of creating uh, defensible space in terms of uh, breaks in vegetation and less flammable vegetation around their homes. The home's made out of wood siding, but it could also be a, you know, a wood style product that's not necessarily wood or it looks like wood. So this is a good example of what defensible space and home hardening would look like. Next one, please. This is a bad example of what it would look like. Uh, so trees are right up around the house. The, the house has dead pine needles everywhere. There's dead limbs from the tree hanging over the chimney and the top right up there. So, and it, as first responders, and, and CAL FIRE does a lot of wildland fire response, uh, we are not gonna endanger the lives of our first responders. And if you have not done your due diligence to try to protect your home, then there's not a lot we can do to help you. But if you've done your due diligence and, and you've done some other measures that I'll discuss later too, then we have a much better chance of being able to stay and defend your home. Next slide, please. Again, another bad example of, of defensible space and home hardening. There's vegetation all over the place on the, on the home itself. And, and so this is not what you want your property to look like. Next slide again, please. And this is a good example. So the home is made of fire resistant materials. There's not very much vegetation around. You can see it's still okay to have some trees and some vegetation around your home, but you want to make sure you remove any dead and dying material from it and make sure that you clean whatever vegetation falls off onto your home from the tree on a regular basis. Next slide, please. Okay, so that was the ready component of ready, set, go. So next is set. All right, you've done what you can to prepare your home to uh, survive through a wildfire. Uh, now you need to get your family set, right? So you need to develop a wildfire action plan and put together an emergency supply kit. And really, you could get rid of the wildfire component of that and just say emergency action plan, right? Because we have, we just had the, the large earthquake in Trona, and the earthquake is also a very much of a concern in Southern California. And so all these things that we talk about here apply to earthquake preparedness as well. Next slide, please. So what you would want in your wildfire action plan, you wanna identify a meeting location. If you get separated from your family or if not everybody's home together, identify an area outside of where the hazards may be where you can all meet and make sure that everybody's safe and together. You wanna have multiple escape routes from your home or your community, right? So not just a single point of ingress and egress because if something happens and that road's no longer accessible, then your whole plan has kind of gone out the window. So you want to identify multiple ways to, to evacuate. Uh, you want to have contingencies set up for pets or large animals, especially horses. Uh, you know, trying to load them into a trailer and get them out and navigate roads that are congested and it's smoky and it's chaotic. And so you want to prepare for that ahead of time. And then have a communication plan, especially having an out of area contact where everybody, if you're not with your family, they can all check in with that person because cell towers or cell lines are gonna be busy, potentially landlines are gonna be down. So having an out of area contact that you can all communicate with and make sure everybody's safe. Next slide, please. Uh, and these are the six Ps. If there's an immediate evacuation, the thing you would need to prepare for and be ready to grab as you're heading out the door, right? You don't even need to think about it. You should know where these things are and you're ready to go. People and pets, if you have young children or elderly people in your family that may require a little extra attention, you want to be prepared for them. And dogs, cats, hamsters, 
whatever. Uh, papers, phone numbers, and important documents, maybe in a fire safe box that you can just grab and take out the door with you. Prescriptions and eyeglasses, especially if you're dependent on those, you want to have extra ready to go set aside so you don't have to think about it. Pictures and irreplaceable memorabilia, again, if you can have that in a single location where you can just grab it and go, that will uh, help expedite the process. Personal computers, hard drives, and disk, most everything is stored on there anymore. And then cash, credit cards, uh, some kind of money. So if you're away from your home for an extended period of time, you're prepared. Next slide, please. And these are the things that you would put in your emergency supply kit. Again, taken from our Ready, Set, Go materials. The first uh, Red Cross has their own version of it. Probably your local fire department or emergency response organization has their version of it. But uh, you end up seeing a lot of the same things in there. Water, non-perishable food, change of clothes, uh, battery-powered radio, flashlight. Again, so you can remain in contact and be prepared to be away from your home for who knows how long. Next slide, please. Uh, so that was set, right? You're getting ready in case a, a, an event occurs, you're ready to go. Now the day is there. There's a wildfire in your community. What do you do? You're, you're getting ready to go. Uh, so you need to you can have your evacuation checklist ready to go. You've prepared with your family. You have your action plan. You, have your, you can put your emergency kit in your car. And you can get your car out of your garage, pointing towards the street. So if you need to evacuate, you're immediately ready to go. Have your windows up. Wear long sleeves so you can protect your skin in case there are if there's heat or embers in the air. Uh, and then you want to, there will be, typically there's uh, voluntary evacuations and then it, if it continues to be a threat, there will be a mandatory evacuation. And so really for the safety of you and your family and first responders, when that voluntary evacuation uh, gets put in place is the time for you to go because there's gonna be first responders attempting to come into your neighborhoods to put the fire out and protect your homes. And if they have to worry about trying to have a line of cars trying to get out while they're trying to get in, it makes it very hectic and chaotic and difficult to do what they need to do to protect your, you and your family and your home. So when those voluntary evacuations are, are um, put in place, that's the time for you to go. Next slide, please. And so this is, uh, other things that you can do to your home as you're preparing to evacuate that can help protect your home and make things easier for first responders. I'm not going to go all over all these. Again, we have the information back there. But some of the things you can keep in mind are turn off your air conditioning. So if you leave that on and it gets hot and it kicks in, that's going to be pulling embers into your home uh, immediately. Uh, close all your doors and windows, but leave them unlocked so first responders can get in if necessary. Uh, if you have hoses and hook them up to the spigot, put ladders up against your house so first responders need to get up there, they can do so very quickly and easily. Uh, if you have light blinds, you want to pull them to the side because the radiant heat can cause those blinds or window coverings to ignite, but if you have heavier duty ones, you can close those to try to minimize the amount of heat that comes in. And you want to make sure you maintain clearance around any propane tank you may have uh, on the exterior of your house. You can pull um, flammable lawn furniture away from your homes and put it as far away as possible. Again, everything that you think may increase the risk of, of your home catching on fire, you can get that away. And, uh, so next slide, please. And then lastly, uh, there's a ready, set, go in the case of there is a wildland fire event, but we can also do the best that we can to minimize the chance for wildfire to occur. So we have our one less spark slogan. Next slide, please. And so that's really just being conscious of the activities you do that can result in, in uh, fire starting. Over 90% of all fires and wildland fires in California are human caused. Typically power equipment use, lawn mowers, weed whackers, things like that. Landscape debris burning, which probably don't get much in the city of LA. <laughs> uh, and campfires and vehicles. So just being conscious if you're pulling over on the side of the road, don't stop in a large patch of dry grass. Catalytic converters are known to, uh, as they get older, spit metal, a hot metal out, and that into a patch of dry grass can cause a fire to start and spread into the wildland. Next slide, please. And again, don't use power equipment before 10 a.m. Don't use it on hot, dry days, windy days. Make sure 
uh, gas engines have spark arresters and keep exhaust systems clean of carbon buildup and debris. Next slide, please. And this is CAL FIRE's website, readyforwildfire.org, where you can find all of this information and more. And that's all I have, so thank you very much for your time. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and how dare they have me follow this gentleman. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you all for coming out. Once again, my name is Armando Hogan. I'm the deputy chief in charge of operations West Bureau for the Los Angeles Fire Department. I've got nearly 37 years in this business. And I still want to work hard every day to figure it out. A lot of the things that Chief just uh, spoke about, which I do appreciate, without me going over that same thing, I'm just going to kind of take it in a slightly different direction and even though we're talking about preparedness and resilience I want you to understand that that starts with you and what does that mean a good mindset you taking care of yourself you making sure you're situationally aware because if you're not ready we can't ask you to be able to help your family or go out and help the community so the way I look at it is a three-prong approach it starts with you the individual then it becomes a force multiplier with your family, and then, if able, to get out into the community to see what you can do. The way we try to do that is through our CERT program that you see there, Community Emergency Response Teams, and that's kind of an opt-in process where individuals volunteer their time, which I can't thank them enough. I was very fortunate to be one of the original instructors with the Community Emergency Response Team some 30 years ago, so I'm very proud of that program, and how many folks would we say we got trained here in the city? About 10,000 folks. And that's Bob. He's our CERT coordinator for Battalion 5. That's Jackie in the back. And here in the city of L.A., we have it by battalions. And this is the footprint now in which you sit is what we call Battalion 5. The other thing I want to point out is no one is able to do this alone. And that's why I'm honored to sit up here with this outstanding panel, because we all partner. Right? It's easy to say we do it or I do it or they do it. No longer does that work. And also that partnership carries over to you all. Once upon a time it was very early or easy in the early portion of my career to just tell people what to do and expect you to get it done. Right? Now what we want to do is collaborate and partner with you, better educate you so the right hand knows what the left hand is doing. So if you see us at the command post, you know what we're doing. When we start uh, speaking to terms about anchor flanking and pinching a fire, trying to stop the forward progress of the fire, you all have a better understanding of what that is. And if we can reduce your anxiety just a little bit so that you're better prepared, we will all have a better opportunity to get through whatever challenges we may face. I know a lot of times the focus right now is on brush fires. I want to be mindful, to your point, sir, you just spoke about the recent earthquake. So we have to be mindful of anything. Here in the city, we can have an active shooter. We can have bomb threat. Uh, you know, we're still one of the West Coast targets with the airport. There are so many issues. But through our preparedness, through our opportunity to better educate ourselves and each other, I look at that as creating our own personal defensible space. If you go to LAFD.org, on that website has a lot of the information you uh, saw there and we believe in redundancy and the reason we do that because that way if you do it once do it twice and do it a third you're going to be better at it so if you hear it from this gentleman you hear it from me you're going to hear it from this gentleman you're going to hear it from that gentleman and hopefully it sinks in we realize you have a lot of things going but without you we can't get it. so i'm not going to take too much more of your time because like i said i followed a, a five-star individual there but like this gentleman to my left, I think I've known him even back when I had hair. So we've worked together a while because we don't want to just partner with other fire agencies. We want to be able to talk with those who are in the industry that can make it work for us, that can make it better, that can give us a perspective that we may or may not have. We want to get out of this business where we have tunnel vision and make sure we create that peripheral vision so that we're providing better service to you. And then I'll leave you with this. What we're doing uh, here in West Bureau is we're doing evacuation drills because evacuation could happen at any point in time. And we focus on two things, an orderly evacuation of getting you out and then, of course, possibly sheltering you in place. But we've been unfair, right, because if I just sit here and say I want you to shelter in place, what does that mean to you? You saw some excellent slides that give you an idea of what sheltering in place is, but until we actually practice it, until we actually exercise it, we're not going to be clear. So that's what we're looking to do. We're going to have that drill, 
in November, and I'm going to be partnering with my Safe LA. I'm going to be partnering with CERT. I'm going to be partnering with, with the council offices, with the mayor's office, because if we all don't know what we're doing, we're all doomed to be uh, failures. And that is, I'm sorry, that's just an option that we do not want to pursue. So once again, I thank you one, I thank you all for your time here this evening. It's great to see you. I'm looking around the room. There's some people I recognize who uh, I work for, right? Go ahead and wave, wave Brandy. You know, to, there you go. So, and it's great because here we have our neighborhood councils. We just did a drill in Mandeville, and when we did the drill in Mandeville, we did it for Mandeville Canyon. That was a singular group. What we're going to do now is try to include three and four groups at the same time. How do we interact with each other? How do we communicate with each other? When we move you somewhere, what information do you need? And I realize everybody's not going to go to a particular shelter. However, it would be nice to know where those shelters are, because your family and friends who may be in another state or in another city are going to be reaching out to you to try to find out what's going on. What better way than to have us all better educated so we can take care of each other? So I thank you one, I thank you all. Please be safe in your travels. And you've seen me, now you're gonna see the best with Dave Barrett. All right, maybe we can get the lights down a little bit. Um, <clears throat> next slide. <clears throat> my name is David Barrett. I am the executive officer of MySafe LA. For the last 11 years, we've been the education partner for the Los Angeles Fire Department. And at this point in time, we work with fire departments all across the state of California. I actually started my morning in Santa Cruz and uh, just got down here about an hour ago. So <clears throat> let's talk for a moment about what we do. Next slide. Um, we are focused on fire and life safety. That means that one of our core missions is to teach the public about all of the issues, issues related to fire and life safety. We also build community resilience. We have a brand new resilience program that's coming out in the fall, which incorporates what Ryland does, uh, which is Ready Your LA Neighborhood, and uh, all of the various pieces together. People aren't always necessarily sure, do I need to do it, should I do it? We want to help push that forward so we make the lifting less heavy and the engagement more positive and accurate. And finally, we collaborate with fire departments, such as LA City, to collaborate in t training their firefighters. As an example, right now we've just finished a program for uh, decontamination following structure fires so that we can reduce the threat and risk of cancer to firefighters, which is the number one way that firefighters these days are killed. Next slide. So let's talk about wildfire. Next slide. I'm here to talk to you about the real world, what happens in the street, what happens in your neighborhood stuff, so that it can make an impression upon you. Each one of these presentations we're making, that's starting with CAL FIRE and going all the way down to the insurance issues, are designed to help you be motivated to do something. If we're all just together and we say, oh, that was nice, I had a good time, then it doesn't necessarily lead to anything productive, and we want to make sure we're doing that. So you're looking there at a, a, a firefighter who is looking up at uh, 100 plus foot flame lengths. Next, next slide. Um, and it's expensive and it happens more and more frequently. There you're looking at from uh, 1992 all the way through 2018 and you'll see that the number of fires continues to grow every year for the most part. There are occasions, uh, a rainy year, a cold weather year when fires don't necessarily seem to be as bad. We've been fortunate this year, the wildfire season has started off slowly, but keep in mind all of that fuel that is growing because of the rain, it's not going to necessarily ignite just because it's hot. Uh, the oils in a lot of those vegetation components, and we still have a lot of dead trees in California, there's a lot of reasons why this fall could be very, very dangerous. Next slide. <clears throat> so another example, take a look at the sign at the bottom where it shows 30 miles an hour and look at the length of those flames. Now, what's important about that is that 30 minutes earlier, that might have been just quiet and calm and clean. And that's one of the things to be concerned about relative to wildfire. Next slide. So, <clears throat> okay, well, so it was kind of hard to see in here, but where the little circle is in the corner, that's a person standing there. So let's move on and show another example. So the human toll, take a look at what's happening, of course, last year. Uh, in the town of Paradise, we had uh, many, many fatalities. But overall, we're losing more and more people, and unfortunately, even firefighters who put themselves on the line, they put their bones at risk every day to save you. And relative to Ready, Set, Go, if you don't go, 
then firefighters are going to have to come and get you. And if they come and get you, then you're putting their lives at risk. So think about someone else as well and evacuate when you're told to do so. Next slide. So that's a scene from Paradise, and you can see that it's not fun work. Next slide. So the cost is also huge. One of the real issues is who pays for all of this? And in the last couple of years, uh, the, the budgets for managing wildfire mitigation and suppression in the state of California have been used up before the summer. Uh, and if, if the money's gone before the summer, then it requires emergency money. And at some point in time, there isn't any money. So the more that we can do now to collaborate as a team and to work together with all of the organizations and with all of you, whether you're at home watching this, you're here in this wonderful facility watching, we need to collaborate. And we need to do it before there is the next disaster, not afterwards. There's always money afterwards. There's always recovery plans afterwards. But there isn't beforehand, and we need to focus on that next. So that's out in Silmar. Uh, in 2008, uh, those homes all disappeared within an hour and a half. And it's just an example for you to see what's going on. Next slide. So let's talk about what you can do. Next slide. All right, we've heard a little bit about it, but let's make it simple. Prepare your space. If you've got eaves that are full of leaves and other debris, it's, this is a very important thing to think about. We talk about defensible space and clearing out brush, but let's talk about your fireplace for a second. If you put a big log in your fireplace and you take a match and you put the match up to the log, your log's not likely going to start burning, right? You're going to need to put kindling around that log and use that kindling to get the fire going. What you're seeing right there in that eave, that's kindling. It's kindling that will then ignite the log, which is your house. So think about that, and think about it not just in things like your eaves, but anything that's connected to your house. It could be patio furniture. It could be firewood that you've got stacked up. It could be any number of things that could become a fuel source that would then be the kindling that would cause your house to burn down. I'll show you another example in a moment. Next slide. All right, so here is a home. This is uh, in uh, Riverside County, uh, in one of the... In the um, one of the fires outside of Murrieta, you can see this house is surrounded by fire. Yet the, the home survived 100% intact. And it's because the homeowner had participated in everything you heard about. So it's one thing to look at a graphic drawing. Here we're looking at a real life world image of a home that's being attacked by wildfire on three sides and it survives. Next slide. So we hear about making a plan. One of the interesting things about making a plan is most people don't do it. Right? So why don't most people don't do it? If, if you're going to be all upset and up in arms after your house burns down, it's, that's a little late to be upset if you haven't made a plan, if you haven't taken the steps to protect yourself. A couple of things that I would share with you is you could store valuable documents in the cloud. It doesn't matter whether you use Macintosh technology or Android technology or Windows technology. There are plenty of sources where you can store insurance documents, receipts, photographs of your house. One of the number one issues following a wildfire is that people try and get reimbursed through their insurance company and they have no records to support the things that we're talking about. I'm sure we'll hear about that a little bit later. But I'm telling you, if you don't have photo at least photographic evidence of what you have, it's going to be very problematic for you. The Woolsey fire, which occurred at the end of last year, um, we did a survey and went through a number of the streets where homes were lost. Many of those homes are being purchased by, or those lots, are being purchased by investors at half their market value because the homeowners cannot be compensated enough to rebuild because they did not inventory their materials and they did not properly insure what they have. Next slide. So here's an example, again, this is in Murrieta, uh, of a wildfire there, um, and this is showing you the evacuation process. Firefighters will be there to help you if you have mobility problems. Here we see an AMR ambulance and firefighters helping a woman that can't get along, along on her own. And you'll see that there are type one fire apparatus for structure defense all the way up the street. So the, the fire departments really across California are now well coordinated to follow the same operating guidelines so that it doesn't matter whether you're in LA or San Diego or San Francisco or Santa Cruz, the procedures that will be taken to protect your homes are pretty much the same. Next slide. All right, so we've talked about this in terms of uh, 
uh, not waiting, but I will tell you that wildfire can move up to 60 miles an hour. It can move quickly. Next slide. I want to show you an example. So take a look at this bridge. This is actually uh, um, from last year. If you see the arrow up at the top, you'll see there's a little bit line of, of fire right at the top up there. And in the foreground, you see LAPD Valley Division uh, units responding to help evacuate people. The next picture that I'm going to show you is eight minutes later. Next slide. That's eight minutes later. All right. Next slide. That's five minutes later on the same road. So do you want to drive through that? Now, if, you know, less than a half hour earlier, it looked all clear. This is why it's important to take the intelligence that's provided to you, and I don't mean that in terms of smarts, the intel that is gathered by helicopters and by reconnaissance officers and people, com com fire companies that are moving around trying to find out where are the edges of the fire and what is the direction it's moving in and is it terrain driven or wind driven. These things all play an important role. So you want to make sure that you're not put in a position, as many people in paradise were, as one example, to try and drive through that stuff. Next slide. So wildfire is different. That's really kind of what we're trying to tell you. So um, that's from Woolsey. And the foreground is a burned out uh, F-150. And uh, there's a, a lot of flame behind it. Next slide. Uh, and that is also Woolsey. That's, uh, pointed right towards uh, Ventura County, and that is less than an hour after the fire started. That was taken by one of our photographers, uh, and you can see it looks like a bomb. Wildfire, actually, the, the process of mitigating and suppressing wildfire can be compared to actual combat. Next slide. Again, a couple of different images related to the process. Next slide. And uh, this home went from being untouched to this condition in about 10 minutes. Next slide. So a couple things that, uh, that we're doing, we, we as an organization, we teach kids, we teach older adults, we teach families, we go into neighborhood councils. We've got a, a very good program developing with the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. And the, the idea is, is to help you guys be more self-sufficient and to be able to make sure that when you need firefighters that they can focus on suppression and mitigation and that they don't need to worry too much about people not paying attention to the role that they can play. There is a role for you to play before, during, and after. This book, which is going to be coming out shortly, um, is uh, California wildfires throughout Southern California for the last couple of years, seen through the eyes of photographers. But it's also filled with all kinds of educational material that you can download and use and, and interact with. Um, I, something that we'll share widely if you're interested in doing it, but overall this education message cannot be stressed enough because if you are aware, then you're going to be much safer. Thanks very much. Good evening, my name is Jim Acosta. I'm with the Governor's Office of Emergency Services, so I work at the state level. Um, our agency, um, doesn't directly fight fires, we don't uh, directly arrest people, but we make their job easier when a big fire happens, when civil unrest happens. Uh, we're the ones that gets them the additional resources, manpower, and equipment that they need um, in order to uh, do their job. Next slide. So our mission is to um, build California's capabilities and resilience to um, all kinds of disasters. Next slide. So we uh, work on all hazards. Um, we're, uh, we're talking about wildfire here tonight, and some of my later slides uh, we're going to address directly wildfire. But I wanted to give you a little bit of context as to where we come from. So uh, we, we work on every hazard uh, uh, known to mankind. I just uh, spent a few days up in the Trona area uh, on the earthquake uh, response up there. Uh, we've been, our office has been working up there since July 4th. Um, and they're just now getting into uh, recovery mode for that community. Next slide. So uh, California is uh, uh, in the forefront of emergency management. Uh, we, uh, we had a pioneering mutual aid agreement statewide back in the 1950s. Some of you might remember the name Earl Warren was our governor back then um, and later a Supreme Court justice. Um, we also created the Incident Command System, uh, which later uh, the National Incident Management System was based upon uh, after 9-11. Uh, 
Um, and uh, of course, uh, California is the, is the uh, home of uh, the CERT programs, uh, which are uh, now used worldwide. Uh, next slide. Uh, we recognize five levels of um, uh, emergency response in California, and each one of those uh, levels, uh, an increased amount of uh, uh, personnel and coordination occurs. Emergency operations centers uh, are staffed and um, support the field uh, response to the emergency. Next slide. Um, I don't expect you to read all of this, but I just wanted to show you all the different areas that uh, Cal OES is involved in. Uh, we're in uh, response um, and recovery. So right now our recovery side is working with the uh, residents and businesses and, uh, and government organizations that were affected by the earthquake um, in uh, Trona and Ridgecrest. Um, our planning and preparedness division um, helps develop plans for addressing all of the different types of disasters in California. Um, our logistics management uh, works with uh, all the 911 centers in California and supports them. Uh, when one of them goes down, uh, we have uh, technicians and resources that we can um, help back them up. And then um, we are also the, uh, the uh, entry point to California of federal uh, disaster dollars from FEMA and other agencies. Next slide. So our, our uh, foot soldiers in the, in the fight are emergency services coordinators, like that handsome gentleman there. Uh, we uh, actively participate in uh, training exercises and meetings with uh, the counties that we work with. Uh, we participate in emergency operations center activations, uh, acting as the state liaison uh, to uh, provide additional uh, resources and advice to the local communities. And uh, we're, uh, we're out there every day uh, helping counties and cities develop guidelines, procedures, and emergency plans. Next slide. Um, we uh, make sure that we involve the whole community. That means uh, government, private industry, nonprofits, uh, tribal governments, and uh, of course, persons with disabilities and access and functional needs. Next slide. Uh, the governor has the uh, authority under the Emergency Services Act to direct any state agency to assist local government in an emergency. Uh, what that looks like is, uh, for instance, uh, in a, a flood situation where a county um, has roads that are blocked by debris and they don't have the resources to get the roads open for emergency vehicles and ambulances to get through, is we, the, uh, we can uh, task Caltrans to clear local roads. That's not their job. Their job is state highways, but the governor has the authority to use those resources to protect lives and property. Next slide. Uh, our, uh, at our headquarters in Sacramento, we maintain the State Warning Center, which is the 24 uh, hour a day state point of contact for any other state or uh, the federal government. It's also uh, where we take uh, hazardous materials uh, spill reports. Next slide. If there's a major incident, we can activate the state operations center and regional operations uh, centers uh, that are operated by the state to support local governments. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, our uh, Southern Region Emergency Operations Center in Los Alamitos, which is the office I work out of. Next slide. Um, I mentioned funding sources earlier. Uh, uh, we uh, are the input point for FEMA disaster recovery funding and also for uh, emergency management funding and hazard mitigation funding, which is used to um, remove a hazard that, that is known so that the next time something happens, um, it, it doesn't uh, create a, a disaster condition. Next slide. Uh, we also have the state counterpart to the FEMA aid that uh, can come into the state. Um, we have the California Disaster Assistance Act which is under the control of the governor and can assist local governments with restoring public infrastructure. Next slide. Um, in terms of uh, one of our biggest roles is coordinating mutual aid statewide. Uh, we have a fire and rescue division that uh, helps coordinate fire mutual aid, um, a law enforcement branch that uh, coordinates law enforcement mutual aid. That's important in wildfires because law enforcement is responsible for evacuations and you run out of cops real fast in an evacuation, so uh, we get them the additional um, law enforcement officers from different uh, jurisdictions to assist. 
Uh, little, little known capability is coroner's mutual aid. Um, if there's a, uh, an incident that creates a large number of fatalities, um, we have a coordinator that can get that local coroner's office additional resources. So that's, that was used most recently in the Montecito uh, debris flow incident and as well as the uh, campfire in Butte County. We uh, also uh, sponsor what's called the Emergency Management Mutual Aid Program, which provides trained uh, emergency operations center staff to assist local governments um, if, uh, if they run out of staff just because they have to run 24 hours a day, you run out of people really quick. So uh, we assist with that. And then we also uh, are the uh, coordinators of state-to-state -state mutual aid for the, uh, for the state of California. Um, and that's uh, a, uh, a contract that's signed by all 50 states uh, where we can uh, provide uh, assistance across state lines um, in, a, in a legal and coordinated fashion. Next slide. Uh, Cal OES sponsors uh, over 120 uh, fire engines in local fire departments statewide. Um, the, uh, the deal that we have with the local fire departments are that we will give them a new fire engine to uh, use as, as they wish within their jurisdiction. Um, they're responsible for staffing it and in a large fire where we need mutual aid, they agree to provide that engine with staffing to the effort uh, to uh, 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 help another uh, jurisdiction. So that's, that's a very popular program. Next slide. We uh, participate along with the U.S. Far Forest Service and uh, Department of the Interior Fire Agencies in uh, the Southern California Coordination Center, uh, which is in, uh, uh, right off the March Air Force Base um, site in Riverside County. Um, that's known as uh, South Ops. Next slide. Uh, boy, this slide really didn't come through, did, did it? Um, so on our uh, Cal OES website, which is caloes.ca.gov, uh, you can also, if you wanted to search for it, you can search for California Emergency Services, and we pop right up. But this is a, a page that we have on uh, wildfire resources. Um, right now it has information specifically about the Camp Fire, the Woolsey Fire, and the Hill Fire. Uh, because those are our most recent uh, major fires. Um, uh, there's, uh, it's, it's interesting if you're interested in you know, how recovery works for, uh, for fire victims and governments, uh, there's links on there uh, as to what programs are available and how people qualify for them. Next slide. And that's it, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for being here today. My name is Sally Westlake and I'm from Insurance Commissioner Ricardo Lara's office, the Department of Insurance. His job as Insurance Commissioner is to regulate the $310 billion insurance industry in California. $310 billion. California has the largest insurance market and in, uh, we are the largest in the United States and we are the fourth largest in the world. What does that mean? $310 billion is what we all pay in insurance premiums to the insurance companies. So his job is to regulate all those insurance companies, agents and brokers, making insurance available and affordable to the consumers. Next slide, please. So we're the largest consumer protection agency in the state of California. And we have some facts here, but the most important thing you need to know that as a consumer, if you ever have a problem with your insurance company, agent or broker, whether it's auto insurance, homeowners, life insurance, you can call us for help. All of our services are free. Our toll free number is 800-927-4357. And our website, insurance.ca.gov. We have a wealth of information on there that you can access. We have something called a premium survey, comparison tool. We have a list of all the insurance companies and their phone numbers with the lines of insurance that are allowed to sell in the state of California. More importantly, we also have something called a complaint study. Every year we publish how many justifiable complaints are filed against the insurance company. You should know who you're paying because you don't want to be the next person filing a complaint against the insurance company. See how your insurance company ranks up to the next insurance company. Next slide. 
So we're going to talk about homeowner's insurance, right? Definition of insurance, it's a form of risk management. It's meant to put you back into the same financial position you were in prior to the event, prior to the loss. Our biggest asset for most Americans is our home, our biggest financial asset. Yet most people spend more time shopping for their TV than they do for their homeowner's insurance. I know insurance is a complicated topic, but it can be the difference of you being able to build your home after a fire or not. So ask yourself the question, can I rebuild my home if a fire rips through my house and I lose everything? Yes, maybe, not sure. If you're not sure, that's a problem. You should know, you should be able to answer with a definitive yes, that yes, if I lose my house to a wildfire, I have enough insurance coverage that I can rebuild my home. I just mentioned it's a $310 billion insurance industry in the state of California. It's a for-profit business. Not all insurance companies charge the same. Not all policies are the same. Coverages are different. It's up to you to determine what you have, that you have enough coverage to be able to rebuild your home. If you have an actual cash value policy, you probably won't have enough coverage to rebuild. If you have a replacement policy, you might be able to rebuild. If you have a total replacement policy, you should be able to rebuild. Okay? Things are changing when it comes to rebuilding costs. So you have to have um, code upgrade endorsements added to your policy. Up in Paradise, where the entire town burned down, talk about inflation of cost to rebuild your home. Because when you go to Home Depot, there's no more lumber. There's no more general contractors available to rebuild that house. So all those costs go up, suddenly skyrocket, above and beyond what you anticipated when you initially got your policy. So what you need to do is call your insurance company, agent, broker, and have that conversation. If I lose my home to a wildfire today, do I have enough insurance? They should be able to have, they should be able to tell you yes, explain to you yes, you have enough. This is what it covers, this is what it doesn't cover. If you're not sure after you have that conversation or you can't get a hold of your agent or insurance company, you should be calling us. Second step you can do is do a home, in, do a home inventory guide of your home. Room by room, you're going to inventory every single thing you own inside your house. I know it's tedious. Some of you have been in your home 20, 30 years, and you're like, what? You want me to write down every single thing I own inside my house? Yes. If you lose your house completely to a wildfire, your insurance company says, we'd be happy to pay you. Just tell me what you had. And you're like, I don't remember everything I had. I just lost my house. Yes, I remember the big things. But without a complete list, a complete inventory of every single thing you own in your home, the insurance company doesn't have to pay you up to your maximum limits on your personal property. That's what happened in Paradise. The comp insurance company said, sure, we know you lost everything. The town is gone. Just give us a list. Just imagine having to sit down after what you've just gone through and trying to write down the model number, the purchase date, the purchase price of everything you owned. I have the um, booklets back there at my table. Please pick one up. Home inventory guide, you're going to do it now. Some people ask, well, I'll take pictures. Pictures are great. The insurance company says, great, you have pictures. Not just give a list. Just give us a list of everything that's written down. They're not going to look at your pictures and determine the price. They're going to say, give us the model number, the purchase date, the purchase price. So videotape, pictures, receipts, all those things help. But eventually, you're going to have to have a list. So if you do it now, before you actually need it, it can save you thousands of dollars, hours of headache. I always have someone that says, well, I know I don't want to keep it in my house because if the house burns down, so does the proof, so I'll keep it in my car. No, not safe in your car because your car gets stolen. They look in the compartment, they have your address, and now they have the home inventory guy telling them exactly where all the good stuff is, right? And exactly when you bought it. So, you don't, and you also don't want to give it to your next door neighbor. Okay, no matter how much you love them and you trust them because likelihood of their home being damaged is very high. 
So you're going to keep that home inventory guide safe outside of the neighborhood, at a family member's home, at the office, at the bank, so more safe. So when you leave here today, you're going to take two action points, okay? Two things you're going to do to be better prepare yourself. Call your insurance company, your agent, determine what type of insurance policy do I have? Do I have enough insurance coverage? If I lose my home today, can I rebuild? Second point, you're going to do a home inventory guide. If you have any questions about insurance <clears throat> policy, coverage, you're giving us a call. And uh, earthquake insurance. Huh? A lot of people say, well, we can't afford it. We think it's too high. When's the last time you've gotten a quote? Most policies are placed through the California Earthquake Authority, but you start off up to, uh, getting a quote from your homeowner's policy. Your homeowner's insurance carrier is who you call and get a quote. There's been changes made to the earthquake insurance policies that's making it more affordable. Remember, you can always up the deductible, lower the premiums to make earthquake insurance more affordable. Let me ask you, are you in a position to say goodbye, to lose all the equity in your house because of an earthquake? If you don't want to give up that equity, and I talked to a person earlier in, in, from the audience that says they own their home, 100%. If you're able, if you're in the position to say goodbye to all that equity in your house because you don't have earthquake insurance and you lose your home to earthquake insurance, then you need to consider purchasing earthquake insurance. I have a brochure in the back. If you have any questions, you can see me afterwards. A personal planning guide, another workbook that you should do. It's called an emergency insurance information booklet you fill out before you have an emergency. That's where you're going to write down who your insurance carrier is. Uh, <clears throat> all the phone numbers that's important to you, your doctor, okay, your bank accounts, so that if an emergency happens to you, your spouse, your family members know who to call, where the insurance policies are, so they know that insurance policies don't lapse and they can collect on the life insurance policies. Another workbook, something important you need to do now to be better prepared. Next slide. So uh, the Department of Insurance is there on site at, at the local assistance centers. We were up there at Ridgecrest right after the initial quake ha happened because we're there to help make sure that the consumers can find, obtain their insurance policy information. We, we're assisting them um, filing their insurance claims, making sure they understand the process they can um, better assist them in filing a claim and making sure that they don't have any complaints against their insurance companies, that they get rightfully what's due to them under their policies. Uh, we also, in the rebuilding process, a couple months down the line, uh, when they, with all the debris removal is done and they're now trying to rebuild their home, we also have our own insurance claim workshops, making sure we're assisting the claimants um, rebuild their home and go through that process. So again, if you have any questions about insurance, give us a call at our toll-free number or visit us on our website. Thank you. Well, before we go to questions, let's give all of our panelists a big round of applause. And that was really terrific information. Thank you. I know it's a lot of information to digest, uh, and it, there is a lot of resources available online and through these various offices in the back of the room, and I hope that you'll all avail yourself. I know I will be taking home a whole bunch of material uh, to look at, uh, and I hope that everybody does as well. And with that, we'll go to the audience for any questions anybody has. Okay, we have a couple of questions. A number of you have uh, talked a little bit about evacuations, which are come from the top of your list, I think. Um, PG&E has been very forthright in talking about cutting off power during certain incidents. And I believe they've done that once already. Um, I have not heard anything from LADWP about what their policy is going to be about this. I would imagine an evacuation at 12 midnight with no power in your neighborhood a much more difficult thing than what we're talking about here tonight. So for LAFD or for the city, what is DWP going to do and 
would they please let us know what they're planning on doing? For your question, sir, uh, we're working with DWP. I actually have a contact. I won't speak for them, but one of the things that we have done is basically initiated the process in terms of preparedness plan because right now we look at them more from a recovery standpoint here in the city but the other thing we looked at based on what's happened with PG&E and some of the other uh, utility companies so they're looking at what do we need to do the challenge is there's a delicate balance do we start shutting off power just because there's a threat or because there's an imminent threat so we've got to basically be very careful in terms of how we do that because sometimes shutting down a whole grid may impact individuals who, no, who are not directly affected so it's a delicate balance that they're looking to, to strike. And for the most part, we're all working together as I talked about that collaborative process. We can hold it like, okay. Um, we, we live up in the hills right here, just a, two miles from here. And uh, a lot of what we were shown, and uh, which we, we've heard at least once before at a previous workshop, uh, really doesn't apply directly to what where we live because our neighborhood was developed back in the 1920s or 1910s. None of this kind of information was available at the time. The roads are not up to the standards and all this kind of thing. So a lot of what you were showing is great for more suburban, more recently developed kinds of areas. And where does that leave us? Uh, is what I'm concerned about because, uh, for example, the setbacks in terms of clearance and so on, where we can't clean our neighbor's, air, uh, neighbor's backyards or side yards uh, and they can't clean ours. Uh, we had a visit not very long ago at our request from a senior uh, fire uh, official here in Los Angeles and he looked around and he said, yes, uh, all that vegetation as long as it's green and it's moist and we, it's not, we don't consider it to be a fire threat even though it's right close to your house. So that was a little inconsistent with what some of the things that we were being told. So what do we do in an older neighborhood with um, 1920s, with 1920s standards? Uh, sir, to answer your point, are you talking about you're here in Los Feliz? Okay. So one of the things that we're Felix, I apologize. I'll just use my side voice. Here, okay. I'll try this one. Thank you. We don't look at what year or whatever. I understand the narrower streets and things of that nature from the way it was built, but our fire inspectors have gone out and looked at just about all of the parcels. We've been able to leverage technology where we send out uh, drones to take a look. We've also had people on foot. And one of the things that we didn't do this year with our uh, brush clearance program was if you didn't have a problem, we didn't get back to you. So we already looked at what is the defensible space, which for us is about 200 feet uh, from the property line that we're looking for you to clear out. I know there's been some challenges with your neighbor and so forth, but our fire prevention folks are working through that. And even some of the areas that may even be considered state where that borders and some of the MRCA land, we're also working with those individuals to make sure, depending on where you live, when we start getting over closer by Griffith Park and so forth. So there, the plan remains the same. When there's an evacuation, we're gonna come and get you out of there, us and LAPD. But I understand the concern, so that's why we talk a little bit more about sheltering in place, so we don't create those gridlocks right there in the middle of the street. But on red flag days as well, we're looking at that. Although in the city of LA, we've probably only had about three in the last year. But I know when you hear Ventura County and so forth is having a red flag, it doesn't mean here in LA we're in red flag mode. But what we're looking to do is be uh, have a more robust approach on red flag days, making sure we're enforcing through DOT. We also work with our rangers to make sure that we're all on the same page. But we want to make sure that we keep those uh, areas that we need to traverse as uh, clear and as best. not specific to, 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 to your condition at all, but clearance also doesn't mean that you don't have anything there. And this is um, very important, especially on hillsides where erosion's an issue. Um, the, you can have um, live plants that are trimmed properly, you know, and the ground being clear so that the fire doesn't travel up into it. And of 
course, some spacing, you don't want things so dense that no one could possibly get through it. But the, the message is not that you need to have everything cleared out of that hundred zone. You want to have non-combustible zones, and particularly zero to five feet, which is new, hopefully will be a non-combustible zone soon. We're working with Cal Fire and the various experts to give homeowners more guidance about what is okay to have planted and what's not. But I, you know, just driving around my neighborhood, and I live in the hills in Glendale, similar condition to Los Feliz. Um, now that I've learned a little bit about this, the number of houses where you have a, you know, an open side yard sometimes, but because of the way that plantings used to be done, the predominant material is planted right up against the house. And, and you know, certainly still a lot of old houses with bougainvillea and vines right on them. Even in a green condition, there's no way that that's going to be as safe as a house that has just a sparse amount of planting right around it and puts, pushes more of the live plant material further away. We had a slide in the last town hall that was really interesting because it showed houses that had cleared too much around them and not provided enough of a, a, of a barrier from embers. So there's a good reason to have some live plant material. So I just say that because I hope that some pe that people don't watch this and think that the message should be to take all the greenery out of their yard or off their slope and have nothing between them and, you know, maybe an oncoming fire. I don't know if any of you want to add anything to that. And I, I did see another hand as well. Is there a microphone over here? We had a microphone going around. My, I have another question, and that is when you were talking about making a list of all of our things that we own, um, and you said we have, like, I'm thinking of, like, refrigerators and stoves, et cetera, with a model. Well, do we have, do we have to have receipts? No. As long as you have a model number, an approximated purchase date, purchase price, that's sufficient. But again, if you're claiming, if you live in a 2,000 square foot home, the insurance company approximately knows you might have uh, your three bedroom house, you, you're gonna have three beds, and you might have three or four TVs. If you happen to be, let's say, a TV collector or something, and you've got 10 TVs in your house, yes, you might need additional pictures, might want a copy of the receipt the next time you purchase an additional TV. But they're gonna, they know you have a refrigerator, they know you're gonna have one, but yes, if you happen to buy one within six months, they're still gonna want a model number, serial number, purchase date to further substantiate what you have. But they're not gonna say for all the, you know, the iron you have in, in your, you know, cupboards, your sheets, in your towels, no, they're not gonna ask for receipts. But if you lose your home in entirety, everything costs money to replace, every single thing. So the more you can document, the better off you are. Can I ask a follow-up question? Are there things that are just not going to be covered by that policy? I'm assuming jewelry is not covered. It are, is, are there up to a certain amount. It's a certain percentage of personal property. So personal property, it's usually 50% of the dwelling. So the dwelling um, cost, again, is not your Zillow current market value of your home that you're going to sell for. So if, because it includes, you've got to deduct the land um, the price of the land. So you have the dwelling coverage, so it's going to be let minus the land, and then from the dwelling is where you start building up your uh, loss of use, your other structures, your personal property limits. Okay, so your personal property limit's going to be some, like usually 50% of your dwelling. So if it's going to take $500,000 to rebuild your home, the personal property limit's going to be $250,000. But then within that $250,000 limit, there's also smaller limits within, which would be for jewelry and art and collectibles and things like that. Um, and it's gonna be probably 10% on things like jewelry, okay? So if you have an extensive collection of art, okay, or jewelry, your, your insurance agent should be telling you hey, do you have more jewelry than this amount? If you do, you need a writer. You need a special addendum, basically, to your policy. If you've got a grand piano, 
if you've got more than $250,000 worth of personal property, you need additional amounts of insurance. Yes. Oh. Substantiate some furniture. I mean, it's burnt. Right. And, and you and furniture is very costly. I mean, how do you how do you prove that your dining room table wasn't from IKEA, but it was you know? Okay, and that's where uh, bought it in. Oh. Okay, so again, that's where pictures would help. Okay, that's where pictures might help. But again, you're still going to have to list that yes, your dining room table, you know, seats eight was purchased on this date for this amount. Okay, with some identifying information, that would help. No, it doesn't have to be notarized. Okay. Thank you. One of the things that could help also in the prevention phase of this, I'm very impressed about the defensive uh, of their, our own homes, but what about the tremendous amount of property that is not improved and whose owners are never being responsible, have never been responsible or held responsible for clearing that. Uh, because I think when a fire comes, the flames will not discriminate between property that is improved or not improved. Yet, those properties that are not improved and full of, of fuel will spread and kill, and, and, and kill the homes that are improved. So I think that we need to focus more on preventing fires from coming outside the homes that are defense. And uh, I think the technology that we have today, uh, and b before I say that, I've been working with, a, with an office that is called the abatement office, uh, somewhere in the 626 area. I don't want to mention names. They have promised me three times that they are going to visit the city where I live in Santa Clarita for me to show them properties that are unimproved where the owners do absolutely nothing to improve th their own properties. And the fire department really doesn't have the resources to do anything about that. The other thing that I was going to mention is that in the world that we're living today, we can also help with technology to uh, the fire department to give them the alerts so that m more timely alerts, rather than a phone call if somebody said, well, I think I see a fire, maybe it's in Burbank, no, 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 it is in LA, et cetera, et cetera, with, with uh, sensors that we can place in certain areas that will be able to differentiate between a barbecue smoke from a real fire smoke, and then a connection with the GPS system will alert the fire department in the five mile radius, or more than one fire department, where the fire is located. So that the time to response is shortened because we know that the fire department responds immediately, but if the alarm doesn't get there timely, the fire department cannot do more than that. So the idea that I'm bringing is that with technology, we can help the fire department uh, giving them uh, faster alerts so they can respond faster. So the propagation of the fire is not as much as it has been so far. Thank you. I, I um, agree with everything that you said. And I think you're really hitting the nail on the head of the direction we have to move in as a state. There's been a few recent uh, exposés, I'd call them, about the fact that in a lot, in some of the fire, the, the state responsibility areas and in some of the county responsibility areas, we're not inspecting in high uh, hazard zones nearly as much as we need to. That we need to be inspecting these properties on a yearly basis and issuing um, uh, notices to correct and in some cases fines and taking action against property owners that are creating hazardous conditions because it's not just their own property that's as, at risk as you very saliently point out. They put the entire community at risk. And some cities are better than this than others and I'll give my own city of Glendale a shout out because as far as I know they do inspect every year 
and as someone who's gotten a couple of notices to correct, and I'll, I'll admit it, and we did correct it, you know, things got a little bit too dry in some places. I know that they're out there, and I know they're driving around, and they're notifying when they, and they walk around, and they walk, you know, all around, and they look at property, and they take it very seriously. But we need all of our cities to be doing that if they have high fire severity zones, and certainly in the state responsibility areas and in um, all of those areas. So there's a group of us in Sacramento that have been pushing the governor as part of the wildfire response to make sure that there's money in there specifically earmarked to inspectors. You know, they do, the, they do as good a job as they can, but they're understaffed. And it's a big state. But we know the areas where we're most likely to have these kinds of uh, events. We're requiring now our utility companies to do much better inspections than they've done and to be responsible for their property. And some of them have been employing the kind of technologies you're talking about. SDG&E in San Diego has been doing a great job at putting sensors on their high power lines so that they, if they have a wind event and a tree hits a high power line, it's, there's a sensor that shuts the line off. Uh, so the technology exists. It's a question of how much we're willing to spend to put that technology in the areas that we need it. But given the economic devastation that these wildfires are causing, we would be penny wise and pound foolish to not be investing what we need to in areas that we know are vulnerable, not just because of topography and conditions, but ones that are near population centers and areas that are most at risk of having this kind of devastation. We may not need to know about every fire that started where you're off in the middle of you know, a national forest somewhere, but we certainly need to know if you're next to Chico, right? Um, so I think that you know, hopefully the governor, I, you know, he's done a very good job at responding, but there are those of us, myself, uh, Jim Woods from Northern California, you know, which is a very fire impacted district, I think it was the Camp Fire, who have been you know, in writing and in person asking the governor to dedicate more money towards exactly the kinds of issues that you're talking about. So thank you for bringing that up. We want to get you on the mic for the uh, camera as well. Um, I was wondering about the emergency kit that you said to have prepared, and I wasn't sure if it was in one of your flyers back there. Um, I saw, I looked through it, and I didn't see it. So, if you just go over to the table, sir, Jackie, would you kind of wave the uh, the go kit, the preparedness kit, the long cylindrical? Uh, it's, it's back there, I'll grab it for you. But anyway, it gives you a whole list. What we really want to discourage is folks going out spending a whole bunch of money on something. There are a number of things around the house, old sheets, pals, things of that nature. But one of the things that has really been a great tool because people want to stay informed and stay connected is the radio. Many of you still have an old transistor radio? Okay. I took my dad's. He used to listen to the old Laker game, so I use his. But that really helps because folks are concerned about I tune in to get information, and I'm speaking mostly from here in the city. So KNX News, you get more of the old AM stations will keep you up to date of what's taking place. But look at that also, and you saw the six Ps that they showed on a previous slide. Be mindful of a kit, not just for yourself, but for your children, and then for the dog. I have a three-pound teacup Yorkie, and that dog gets taken much better care of than I. So she has her own little preparedness kit if we've got to go somewhere. So medication, glasses, plastic, all those different things, we have that on the sheet there uh, to better assist you with preparing your kit. And I'm sorry, uh, I had one more question regarding neighbor issues so I was also speaking to one of the firefighters here about a neighbor that just had like we live in North Glendale it's like really high oak tree area lots of oak trees and a lot of dry leaves a lot of dry leaves like on their roof and their gutters just like piled on so in those cases that obviously it was there for probably a year before their roof probably rotted so they went ahead and cleared it um, but in those cases is it possible to call an inspector so that they can get somebody over there or you can do one of two things and I, and I think this is universal I'd hate to speak out of turn for anyone here but 
you can either call your local fire station, ask them to come take a look, or call the fire station and ask them for the number of the fire prevention bureau where someone can come out and take a look. I know a lot of us see things and go, that's a fire hazard. Sometimes it's more of an eyesore than it is an actual hazard. Now, I realize if we put flame to just about anything, it'll burn. But just want you to be mindful in terms of when you're looking at something doing your personal assessment, get someone else out there to get another set of eyes on it so that way we, we can reduce that anxiety that I spoke about earlier. But also, we can send that inspector over to better educate those folks if there is a problem developing. Thank you for your time, first of all. I have a question. I have um, a home daycare, and I'm required. I'm not sure which of you might know the answer to this, but I'm required to have a landline. And my landline, um, I pay like $30 a month for or something. And it was in case there was an emergency, I could contact if cell service was out. A few years ago, I had AT&T come over to do something with my internet, and it wasn't until my um, line got cut by a tree trimmer recently that I found out that they ran my landline through my internet, and my landline went out. So I was wondering, um, the AT&T person that I called out to repair the line said I could get a new landline. They would have to, they had actually taken out all the wires for that, so it would have to be restrung from a different block and everything. But I was wondering, is it worth it? Like, do we still do that? Like, does anybody have an opinion on that? address that um, you know we could give you our opinions on it but if it affects your license it's your licensing agency you really need to talk to did and am I safer because my bottom line is I want to be safe right I have other people's children I want to know I'm safe so what's the safest thing to do is it to have a landline these days we encourage that you have both from a notification standpoint. Some people who live in the hillside and canyon communities have poor uh, cell uh, reception up there, so the fallback for that is to make sure you have a hard line. Are you in the city of Los Angeles, ma'am? Close, close enough. Glendale. I'll talk to L.A. County. You and I can talk later because when it comes to daycare facilities and so forth, we have uh, inspectors that specialize in that. So that way we don't give you misinformation. I'll make sure I give you a phone number before we walk away today. You can make a phone call and we'll help you get that resolved. One knows exactly where you are and the cell phone uh, may not. So that may be why they require it. Could I ask a question too since I've got here? Uh, I know after an earthquake, we may have fires in several areas of the city and we'll be understaffed, I think, for firemen. Could you guys speak to how the state and other agencies will help bring firemen in here very quickly and how, that, how you guys see that working? Well, I think OES uh, might be a good person to speak about that because they typically coordinate responses of, of that nature. Every county fire department has, an, uh, has, has a mutual aid coordinator in their department. And then we have a state mutual aid coordinator that works directly with them. So as soon as uh, it, it, there's the uh, notification of a major earthquake, um, they uh, just start pushing resources down from, from other aid, uh, areas that are unaffected uh, they don't wait for the local fire departments to, to request them. They start pushing the resources, and then they reconcile the, the needs when the resources get down to staging areas in, um, in the affected area. Um, so this is, uh, California does fire mutual aid better than anybody else. They, um, they have systems set up to where if, if, uh, uh, if a number of uh, engines are dispatched to a call from one area, there's other engines from other areas that come to sit in those fire stations in case there's a second 
uh, incident that occurs in that area. So this happens every day. It's visible to the public, but it's it's going on in in all of the fire service. And the law enforcement has similar um, uh, mutual aid plans and things. They don't use them as often, obviously, as fire departments do. But um, but it's uh, it's a very organized uh, system that um, uh, I, uh, I'm. I'm very confident that uh, when we have a big earthquake down here, we're going to have all kinds. You're going to have Oregon, Nevada, Arizona fire engines here helping out uh, uh, our, our local folks here. There was also additional, uh, I know, money in the budget this year to help train uh, uh, firefighters and also trying to help train people to do brush clearance um, on utility property. There's a huge need for people to, to do that. I saw a hand over here, I think. Did you have a question? Okay, yeah. We've uh, got, Sarojini, if we've got about can, uh, one minute left. Why so don't we we'll just do these last two because I think they both okay. had their hands up real quick and if you could just go on the mic so the people at home can hear the question. Thanks. So it was more about prevention of the forest fires to begin with. We've had several residents in our neighborhood, neighborhood wonder why there isn't larger signage regarding no smoking several entry points in the Griffith Park, which um, might, uh, because we have a lot of foreigners and a lot of visitors who don't seem to recognize that they are in the middle of a, of a, of a forest, of a park. So I was just wondering if there was ever any chance of that. You must be talking to my husband, because his big thing is people smoking anywhere in the hills near us. It just drives him absolutely crazy and throwing cigarettes out the window. You know, we see people driving through the hills with literally with their cigarettes out their window. Yeah, I, I think that this is um, really city issues. I mean, the cities are responsible for the signage in their jurisdictions or the county if it's county property. And, uh, I, you know, we've, uh, certainly a, a couple members of my household that would love to see Glendale, you know, and LA put up signs as you're going into these areas. You know, you're not going to put it on every street, but it's the major thoroughfares you're entering, a no, you know, caution high fire zone, no smoking, whatever. Uh, smoking is still allowed in people's cars, and probably even walking down the street in some of these neighborhoods. And and Brandy, one of the things that we're doing now, and thank you for the question. One of the challenges we've had in the past is sometimes folks claim they can't read because they're tourists and they don't speak English, or you have other issues where people have literally cut down the signs. So what we're looking to do now, based on uh, some funding that we're trying to get, is to look at what is the proper wording that we should have on. For example, one of the things as agencies that we made a mistake with is we were putting our signage on MRCA land, right? And by doing putting that on conservancy land, they can't enforce what the signage says because it's from the city of LA. So we've kind of, we're looking around, we want to be more strategic than emotional with this and just put a bunch of signs because what ends up happening is people either just knock them down. But now we want to put verbiage that you guys want to see. And what I mean by that is if you say, I got people up here smoking, I got people up here cooking, we've got a homeless encampment situation, whatever that is, we're looking to put the appropriate signage for that particular area. So you and I will talk about that because you know Hollywood United Neighborhood Council is really on the forefront in terms of this signage. So we'll be talking about that in the near future. And that wraps up the Q&A. Thanks. So again, I want to thank our panelists. Thank you. That was really tremendous. And I mostly want to thank all of you for being here. This is such an important topic. And knowing that you're here, you're going to be em hopefully emissaries now for your neighborhoods and go back and talk to your neighbors and keep your eyes open and, and practice what you've learned and join CERT and get CERT trained and all of those things. Um, and if there's any of your neighbors that you think would benefit from this, please point them to the live stream or the not, it won't be live anymore, the old stream, I don't know what the word is, the, the feed, the stream, and they can watch all of this and they can go back and forth and take as much of the material as you want, you know, to, to hand out to your neighbors as well. Thanks, everybody.